This episode will be about the uh, possible remains from the really, really old times of Atlantis or maybe even Lemuria. It seems that uh, the Atlanteans and the Lemurians were not the only advanced races which resided on Earth or at least interacted with men quite actively. But since uh, these two names are famous, in this episode I will use them in a broader sense, using them as somewhat a collective name for all those old civilization about we which we have heard or we have not heard, and about which we don't even know when were they thriving, or indeed was even our um, concept of time and experience perception of time the same at that time, so that we can even apply our method of counting, namely the years. A variety of geographical locations have been suggested as a possible spot for Atlantis. And, in a sense, it's also possible that all of them are correct at the same time. Because pretty often the word Atlantis is used to signify any advanced ancient civilization that we know very little about. And since the legends suggest that Atlantis had a number of cities and districts, it's possible that many of them were built following this round city plan that we usually associate with Atlantis. In addition, they might have had outposts in the neighboring areas, or even worldwide. Possibly the outposts were built following the same round design. It's possible that those that survived the terrible destruction of Atlantis have been building their settlements following the general idea of that round city plan of Atlantis as well. So the conclusion is, not everything that is round is the capital of Atlantis. In the previous episode about the Americas, we saw also that modern cities in both the west and east coast are built on older ruins, about older channels at least, water channels, about which we know absolutely nothing. Part of those ruins is the very familiar round design for a city. Maybe even that city is a type of a distant memory of the Atlantean design of cities. The Atlantic Ocean seems to be the most promising prospect for finding well-preserved underwater ruins of an ancient, advanced civilization. Most map providers have already switched to what is called the most recent and detailed map of the ocean bottom available. In reality, it's the most smudged image you can find. There are some map providers that still keep portions of the older, more detailed maps, but we are not aware of anyone displaying online maps we could see just years ago on the Internet. Here is sitting side by side. On the left is the most recent one. Obviously, data has simply been removed. These are the Azor Islands in the Atlantic Ocean, the place where, according to legends, Atlantis should have been situated. And there is a good reason for smudging those images, because this is what the boats sailing overhead spotted with their radar exactly in this area. This pyramid looks like just one of the many cones that we can see on the map of the ocean's bottom. Possibly some of the other cones would look like this if the close-up is shown, and that's the reason for obliterating them gradually from the maps. Now that the radar images of the pyramid could reach the public, because it was a privately owned sailing vessel that took them by chance, obviously people were waking up, followed up, and it appeared. 
a very well-written article appeared in the media that the team of very enthusiastic, extremely enthusiastic scientists went to the spot to check and make further discoveries. And then the article assures us that they went there and there was nothing actually there. But what about the deep pyramid that appeared on the radar images? How come that is nothing? Well, the explanation provided was that the radar in the sailor's boat was not giving enough detail, and that's why it looks like a pyramid. But actually, it's not. But I guess the question is now why the team with the better radar didn't publish any images or any scientific report as such. After all, in the beginning of the article, they were explaining to us in detail how well equipped the second expedition was to document the truth and everything that they find. And yet, they publish no finds at all? This type of object was found on the bottom of the Baltic Sea. Again, they took advantage of the fact that uh, ordinary people can't just go over there and they did nothing to explore it seriously. But they made a very clever trick. They called it the Baltic Anomaly. This subtly implanting in our psyche that it is not normal to expect to find such things even when we find them. Now, very similar and uh, much better studied are the findings in the Caribbean region. At least some uh, 20 of them show the necessity of rewriting the history of the full region and in some cases the official history of the full humanity. For example, these are images of what lays almost 700 meters below sea level. That's a lot. According to mainstream geologists, it uh, should have uh, taken tens of thousands of years for this uh, surface to sink that much. And then their penguin colleagues from the history department assure us that uh, this is what we were doing more or less in that time period. But if we were really too busy chewing fur at that time, then who built the 40 meters high pyramids? The large platform and uh, ruins next to the island of Andros are uh, very interesting. Well, first of all, the platform is covered with a couple of rows of megalithic stones. As the ocean currents shift the sands on the bottom here and there, various parts of the platform are being uh, exposed while others get buried. So it is quite huge, probably at least uh, couple of um, square kilometers, means at least uh, the size of a very huge public square. Many of the blocks have regular shape, rectangular. They are placed in a couple of uh, rows. Some of them have two marks. And uh, most amazingly, there are even some ruins of buildings. These are some of the building blocks laying around. This is how the so-called temple looks on an aerial photo and these are the actual remains of the walls underwater. Now this is an image taken by Dr. Greg Little. He didn't really have uh, permission to excavate uh, further but the, the researcher before him discovered that the walls go at least two meters uh, deep in the sand and uh, that wasn't the end. There was uh, no bottom found, no floor, so to say. So Dr. Little and his wife, uh, Laura Little, they are the ones that did most of the work on this site. They could only confirm by scattering a bit of uh, sand around the walls so that um, indeed they do continue in, in the sand downwards 
for uh, they don't know how much. And uh, there are a couple more sites with uh, ruins around this area, this island of uh, Andros. They are listed on their website, the website of Dr. Greg and Laura Little. <laughs> some steps again, part of those ruins. Here you can get some idea of the size of the slabs. These ruins don't fit in the official history of the region, but that doesn't mean that they are necessarily related to Atlantis. They could be part of Atlantis as well, we just don't know. But um, the overall building style is uh, quite similar or maybe even identical with uh, some antique ports of the Mediterranean region. And uh, since in the episode about America we saw that the culture of uh, the antique Mediterranean was also present in the Americas as well, maybe they built these ports. Anything is possible. Here we see some uh, Romanesque uh, looking uh, architectural elements made out of marble. Now the diver is about to reach the first one of them. Here I don't know if you noticed but he starts cleaning it up. And this is another one, or the first piece that cleaned up of the sand. Here is the image of it rotated. Maybe it is uh, easier to see in this way. This is the material the type of marble which these elements have been made. And it's a whole pile of them. Or, I don't know, even some ruins. Dr. Gregory Thomas says that they appear to be part of a shipwreck. He says apparently, but doesn't explain why it is apparent. Also, column-like pieces surrounding the rectangular bottom including a couple of fluted columns, all of this in this very area. So yes, I guess it could be a shipwreck, or they may simply convince themselves it is, because still very few people question the more or less recent history. Many more are inclined to question the very ancient history of many thousands of years ago, but for those who don't question the recent ones, they sometimes tend to make their lives more comfortable by convincing themselves to believe various fictions. So they have a couple of spots with uh, various types of uh, columns. Some of the columns have been uh, taken away already by the penguins. Others have remained. And just a couple of days ago I found out that the characters I've been calling penguins have a proper scientific name. They are called Quackademics. This is just so remarkably suitable, exactly like the frogs. They are so loud. Quack, quack! And you can't hear the other animals. In the same way the mass media is so loud with uh, their quack science that uh, people barely get information about the real interesting stuff like uh, the actual scientific work of the Littles family. The Quackademics have their own crowned king even. A character from Egypt called Hawass. Although the Bimini Road is by far the most famous find in the area, the others are not less interesting. And all these others don't even have proper names yet. They appear to be harbors or jetties in the nearby islands. They have anchors, they have uh, 
many slabs that are perfectly rectangularly shaped and some of them are even in shallow waters. Why are they not studied properly yet? It is not a very recent discovery. We haven't just heard of them. They are known since decades. Well, the Quackademia took serious measures to ensure that uh, proper excavations are not uh, done because it's obvious that uh, such excavations would uh, seriously damage the reputation of the quacks and uh, people may even uh, stop believing them even though they continue to wear their Armani suits. Some sort of corporation was quickly given exclusive uh, rights to do any research in the area and uh, the experts of that uh, corporation, well, they didn't find it really necessary to go into details and dive in water, but the conclusion was already that it is uh, natural bedrock. And uh, as far as the columns and other architectural uh, things, well, they, they must be from shipwrecks, you know. And then further on in these uh, documentaries, instead of uh, showing the actual site where many stones have uh, holes in them, they uh, simply reported that there are no stones at all that show any signs of manipulation. Although many of them are simply pretty much standard anchors, identical to the ones used in the ancient harbors of Europe, for example. And what about the numerous megalithic stones that have perfect rectangular shape? Did the special plum trees in the region start bearing them on their branches? But even these lies were not enough for their documentaries. They went way further. Employing uh, software for image manipulation, they made two blocks that um, are found next to each other to look as if they belong uh, the lines in the stone are connected and they belong to the same slab. Dr. Greg Little was very surprised when he saw that image in the documentary. He examined it and he found out it is a simply an image manipulation and not an original one. And then when artifacts or stones of intelligent design appear, they hide under very uh, misleading uh, labels like anomalous. What does it mean anomalous? It is perfectly normal to have an artifact if uh, there was um, something going on in the past there. Scientific conclusions should be made based on those artifacts actually. People who label them as anomalous don't understand the very basics of the meaning of science.
There is uh, yet another story of pyramids and uh, crystals and again connected with the Bahamas and that's the story of Dr. Ray Brown. A naturopathic practitioner from Arizona and a treasure hunter. So he claims that he has been searching for treasures in the area. And he found underwater glass or crystal pyramids. And even a ball of crystal that he found in some sort of chamber underwater. His story doesn't sound very credible, though. First of all, okay, he claims that uh, his equipment went out of order due to storm and that's why he would not uh, capture any images. But then why he never returned to the spot? That's weird. Treasure hunters are very persistent, actually. They keep returning until they don't uh, get hold of the full booty. And on the top of everything, his story was uh, broadcasted on the History Channel. Do you see the H logo? This H stands for hoax. Only very carefully screened hoaxes are allowed on uh, the History Channel. Hoaxes that will make the folk denser. And the very fact that Ray Brown was allowed to tell his own story in detail and be broadcasted to the world on history, well, it looks more like an attempt to discredit the alternative uh, history researchers and present them in a charlatanian light. But of course, the most interesting appear to be the underwater pyramids of the coast of Cuba. It's a full complex. The stones, as reported by the discoverers, are some roughly 2 by 5 meters and uh, are of a variety that is uh, not a local to the area. And this is a photograph of one of the pyramids. As the research was uh, happening, we read that uh, scientific institutions are working on deciphering the hieroglyphs found down there and uh, yet, till date, for so many years, we still have not obtained images of those hieroglyphs. Findings of this type are extremely uncomfortable for the academics. So what to do if they tell us again that it uh, fell off a ship or that it grows on uh, hortensia plants, well, they may start looking like uh, stupid quacks, but they don't want to look like that. They want to look like quackademics. So instead of trying to explain what this is, they explain to people that it, what it is not, and it is not a historic ruins, and the reason for which it is not is because the academics say so. The only proof presented were their expensive suit and impressively sounding titles. Believe it or not, but there are people with scientific titles who openly say that uh, there cannot be any submerged uh, city at that depth of the coast of uh, Cuba simply because these lands have been on the surface so many thousands of years ago when there could not have been any civilization to build them. That's why it's impossible that they exist. But how come they obtained their scientific diplomas if uh, they are not aware of uh, stuff that is taught in primary school and sometimes even kindergarten? And that stuff is that the scientific uh, knowledge should be based on uh, facts and observations, on uh, real things that you observe around. Instead of that, they refuse to observe because it doesn't match their theories. And despite the ridiculousness of all this, the propaganda of the academics gave excellent results. And uh, here is an excellent example of those results. Another absolutely unrelated uh, expedition, scientific one, is in uh, open sea exploring and scanning the sea bottom. This is what the crew wrote in their diary. 
Some of the rubble on the sea bottom, it means, was so angular and rectangular in shape that the pilot joked that we had found the lost city of Atlantis. That observation was made of the east coast of the United States, but that's how it all ended. A small note in the diary, just one published image, and that was the end, because uh, people were convinced there cannot be any historic uh, ruins underwater, because they cannot be. The academics say so. Now, what about maps of Atlantis? Some of you might have heard about a very clever map maker called Philippe Boage. His map of Antarctica is a proof that he had a connection to that mysterious knowledge of the survivors that we are trying to trace. Well, if he knew such amazing details about Antarctica, the location of its mountain ranges, and how does it look without the ice covering, then it is logical to suggest that uh, he could have known much more. Why on one of his maps he places a huge island in between Africa and South America? The island is not there on his other maps. Was he making a historic map? <laughs> The penguin explanation for this island is that, uh, well, cartographers in those times were stupid and used to place uh, fantasy islands all over the globe as they wish. I'm not sure I want to believe this explanation because we are talking about times uh, that are only 300 years ago. He was uh, the most respected royal cartographer of France. I seriously doubt that a man of such a position would do such actually illegal stuff, placing islands here and there without any proper consideration. The outlining of uh, the parts of uh, Africa and South America that are on the map are very, very correct. doesn't look like a fantasy map at all. I don't know if uh, this mystery island has anything to do with Atlantis, but anything is possible. Because if indeed the drama of Atlantis sinking took place some 20, 30,000 years ago, and considerable movement of uh, land masses took place during and after that, and polar shifts on the top of everything. Well, the Philippe Boash map may look odd now, but that doesn't mean that uh, it looked odd under those circumstances in those times. And as far as uh, ruins of Atlantis, the way it is uh, depicted by the legends as highly advanced technological civilization, probably they simply lie unexplored at the bottom of the ocean and uh, wait for the time when man will decide to switch off his TV and will ask himself, who am I? Where do I come from? It is also possible that to say that they lay down at the bottom of the ocean undiscovered is not very correct. Probably they are very well mapped and discovered already, but because ordinary people can't see without the help of technology what is on the bottom of the ocean, they are simply not aware because the maps of the ocean bottom are being continuously edited to put us in an artificial reality and make us unaware of our heritage. For example, do you notice the line of uh, regular dots? This is that very same area of uh, Cuba where the pyramids were detected by the radars. So even these uh, dots, as uh, the later versions of the maps come up, supposedly improved, these dots gradually get uh, scrambled and they start disappearing, start looking like something else. 
and finally they disappear completely. This is the best, according to them, version. And what is even more disturbing than that is that when they improve the version, they delete the historic version, change the dates, and if you go to Google Earth and see the bottom of the ocean and do uh, go back in history using their tool, you will be shown the current version with old date. You will not be shown the previous version which was obviously much closer to the reality look at the map now everything looks much smooth flat plateaus the sizes of uh, continents all over the place this is not realistic Some historic calendars would have a beginning date thousands of years ago. For the beginning of a calendar, always an important date is taken. Like for the calendar we use, more or less, the time when we at least believe Jesus more or less appeared has become a starting point for the calendar. That's why we say even before Christ. It's another question if he really appeared 2000 years ago or we are just led to believe that was like this. Most likely he appeared just 1000 years ago. But that's a different topic. The point I'm making now is how is it possible that if we were really truing for, let's say 7000 years ago, we would be able to remember that some important event happened at that time and make it a start of a calendar at a later date. Because if we follow the mainstream uh, line of thinking, we could not have invented any calendar 7000 years ago we, because we didn't know what is a calendar anyway or maybe even what is an year or a date. And it wasn't even that long time ago when calendars going back 7,000 years were still in use. This is from Siberia, but the Slavic people also in the area of the Balkans, they also have this date even. They remember that 7,000 years ago something significant happened. So something doesn't seem to add up at all in all these stories that they are telling us. And not only the problem of how we would remember that it was exactly 7000 years ago, but what could have happened anyway besides somebody hitting somebody else with a big stone on the head? And on the other hand, if we were not that simple, then how come all these uh, settlements of primitive people are found all over the world? What about their stone hammers and bone needles we see in the museums? To understand the truth, we should always start with the right perspective that yes, there were simple people, the stone hammers in the museums are real, but alongside them there were always bigger or smaller groups of people or maybe super people for our standards or, or maybe some to some they will look like hybrids between humans and other races although in the real sense we are all aliens and hybrids because we have been introduced here as species we did not appear just like that out of the blue by a lucky chance evolving from violent apes so these groups of more advanced uh, people or beings, they knew more than the savage cavemen or simple tribal people around them. And in many cases, more than us, the modern people nowadays, because they were relying on what they called magic. To translate that in modern terms, it would be high technology. In many cases, based on sound. 
And now I want to give you examples what happens when by chance ruins or artifacts or burials from those advanced centers surface all of a sudden. Very interesting uh, finding from the village of uh, Rijavchik made in year 1969 could uh, very well again be from uh, Hyperborean or Atlantean times. A local worker uh, during his routine uh, mining operations found a two meter long sarcophagus. It laid some seven meters below ground level in the midst of uh, some 20 meter deep coal layer which the miner happened to be mining. He opened the sarcophagus to find, to his uh, utter amazement, a very beautiful lady, moreover perfectly preserved. She did not even look like a well-preserved mummy, she looked alive, as if sleeping. Inside the sarcophagus she appeared to be in some sort of jelly-like substance which at places had pinkish or bluish hue. She was of an approximate height of uh, 1 meter and 80 and her features would resemble um, a very fine European lady of, uh, as of nowadays and her uh, amazing uh, crystal clear blue eyes were wide opened. She wore a white dress with embroidery of colorful flowers and there was uh, some sort of a metal box next to it, maybe the size of a cell phone. The box resembled some sort of device. He called uh, all the villagers and all of them came to see the amazing uh, sight. The sarcophagus stayed open in this way for half day, so really everybody saw it, hundreds, I don't know how big is the village, probably, possibly even thousands of people because uh, there was a full um, firefight fighter department there and the police department, so they also, all of them uh, came to see what's going on. And then the military comrades uh, arrived with a helicopter and immediately uh, took away the finding. Something interesting happened while they were trying to put the sarcophagus in the helicopter. It was too heavy. That's why, to make it easier, they decided to pour away some of that jelly-like liquid to make it lighter. And as they did so, the body, as it was uh, getting in contact with the air, was turning into something that really looked like a mummified and dead body. That greatly surprised uh, all the observers. And then they poured some of the liquid back. As it touched the body again, again the body assumed that appearance of a sleeping person instead of a mummy. And so she departed in the helicopter and something else that these uh, uh, comrades did was uh, meticulously take all the personal details of everybody who saw her on the pretext uh, of um, a possible viral infection caused by a dead body. In a few days, a professor came to uh, view the area of the village. He was very friendly and he even gave a lecture in the local club. He assured uh, the locals that this is the most amazing uh, finding ever, that it will re rewrite completely the full history of humanity, that tests are going on and uh, currently they have found out that her dress is made of a material which we have never encountered. We don't know even what kind of material is that. We have no name for it. That professor also said that they have identified some of the chemical elements of which the pinkish, bluish jelly liquid consists. Not all. He also said that they are working on finding what is that metal box all about.
And uh, so, while people were waiting for this most uh, sensational news to be published, there were mm, small notes uh, published in uh, even the central Russian newspapers and even the biggest communist one called Pravda. There was a small note, but uh, no details. So, how the story developed is after a few weeks, again, the fat comrades came and did a Terror searches of all people's uh, houses, searching for the copies of the local newspaper uh, that uh, had an article with a bit more uh, details about uh, in in relation to that uh, lecture given by the professor who came after a few days. They took away all the copies and again continued um, making lists of the people who knew anything about this. A vast area around the f finding was c declared no entry zone and the exact location was covered with uh, concrete and uh, closed very tightly. And that is how the story ended more or less. Till date, the journalists are trying to find out what happened actually. They are questioning, um, even now in post-communist time, they are questioning the officials, but all they can uh, get uh, their hands on is that uh, this is a uh, top secret uh, case and the only information available about it is uh, that uh, the full area when they got the news that there was an order that the full area is tightly encircled by uh, s soldiers, three circles of them just standing uh, next to each other in order to ensure no access to the area. And as far as all these people who ended up on the lists that um, saw uh, the finding and uh, things like that, uh, those who tried uh, to give interviews in newspapers or question some authorities, within a couple of days of making any such attempts, some calamity happened to them. Maybe a car hit them or a stroke. It was always a very quick and misfortunate uh, uh, circumstances, so uh, all of them, those who tried to uh, speak about it or do anything, are now on the other side. The sleeping beauty of this Russian village is now known as the Tisu Princess, and uh, only remotely similar thing that I can think about is the mummy from China known as Lady Day. She was also found in some sort of liquid and uh, she's remarkably well preserved, although she was mummified hundreds of years ago. According to some sources, along with the mummy of Lady Day, in the burial, and there was uh, an old map of several Chinese provinces, which surprised everybody with its precision. To achieve such a precision, the sources say, one must have had some sort of aerial view of the provinces. Among the other artifacts found in this burial were medical books which described very complex procedures like for example open brain surgery and heart transplant Another place which would make a candidate for Atlantean time artifacts would be the somewhat uh, famous alleged Hall of Images in Romania. From what I have been able to find so far about all this is that uh, what you hear about it is not true. but. As always, there could be some sort of seed of truth 
amongst all the fanciful stories you will find. So, in other words, it is possible that there is something extremely mind-blowingly interesting over there. But what it is exactly, we don't know because all the rumors that were spread are not true. And this is a typical example of artifact that may very well be connected to Atlantis and Hyperborea. It was found in Ural, and is a very famous artifact. They found out that this actually is a map with the rivers in the Urals region thousands of years ago. The most interesting thing about this artifact is that the technology that made it possible to prepare this item is unknown to us. We cannot reproduce it. Even today, we don't know how to imprint this image on the stone nowadays. The very uh, history of the artifact is also very, very illustrative illustrative of what happens to similar artifacts. Okay, that was uh, the opinion of the experts. They concluded, you know, this is uh, this technology is uh, out of our reach. It, it, it shows uh, a, a region thousands of years ago and after that it was exhibited in the museums. It, it is a very much mainstream accepted artifact, not disputed by uh, anybody. Hundreds of photos were taken and yet uh, at the, it was found a few years ago and now here and there and at the moment what is the situation nobody knows where is this artifact and no wonder if in a couple of uh, decades they will start saying oh so where is that artifact maybe it never existed because you see it's not there. Somebody must have photoshopped all those images. There was nothing. Same like with all those uh, bones of giants. Now they're telling us, but there aren't any. The evidence is missing. So all those reports and stories about giants, of course, they're a hoax. There is no evidence. Now let me tell you about a very interesting excavation at the small Bulgarian village called Tsarichina. The great surprise of uh, the local villagers when early morning they found uh, heavy military uh, equipment uh, vehicles to arrive in a great uh, number in their village and start uh, digging without giving any explanation whatsoever to the locals. First of all, they erected some uh, two, three meters high portable wall uh, around the site. The current location is somewhere in front of this house that you see now. And they started uh, digging. Only highest rank generals and the president of uh, the country were allowed to enter inside. The ordinary soldiers, they were just uh, collecting the dugout material and carrying it away in military vehicles. Till date, no explanation has been given to the citizens of the country what was going on. That is why the Bulgarian TV made a documentary. And now I would like to translate for you what the officials have to say about these excavations. It will be not only very sad, but you will have a great laugh. So all these high-ranking uh, generals and uh, the ex-president of Bulgaria simply refused to give any interview or comments on the case. The only uh, people that uh, they could get some information from was an official spokesman of uh, the military in Bulgaria. So let's see his version of the story. He says, and I'm really translating uh, literally, I'm not adding anything. He says that a certain uh, villager, a very ordinary person, nothing special, had a dream at night and decided that uh, in the morning he should immediately go to the military headquarters of the country and tell the people about his dream. 
And I'm not a joking, these are statements of the uh, official statements of the Bulgarian military forces. In his dream, this villager saw the four most renowned Bulgarian poets. Please note that there is no mention that the poets told him anything about the digging or anything at all. He just saw four poets in his dream. And after telling that to the generals, they decided that the first thing in the morning is that they should uh, dispatch their most elite military forces that should start the digging in that village and the digging continued almost two years the underground tunnel went uh, maybe some uh, few hundred meters deep and all because a person saw four poets in his dream but they didn't know exactly where to dig that's why early in the morning they contacted a medium lady with the special uh, astral training so i don't understand they're telling us that all this is nonsense and yet they contact the mediums when they need something the lady was uh, very surprised and she told them that she cannot depart on the second because she is uh, breastfeeding a really newborn baby but they were so persistent that they must do it right now that she had to guide them on the phone where to drive and where to start digging because it was of extreme urgency Later on, the military official uh, continues, it, it is a one-hour documentary, to repeatedly assure us that they, yes, they were digging, that's true, but they never found anything and at the end they stopped the digging. That is his version and he uh, tells the story in great uh, detail, which is again a uh, great love. So he says, how did they stop digging after two years? There was a change in the management in the military and when the new boss came, he just opened the files and he noticed that there is some very strange uh, project that somebody is digging for two years and not finding anything and why look further for alien laboratory that has manufactured some of the human races. I beg your pardon, but from where did the alien races land in this uh, military story in his lies that he's forgetting his own lies that he was telling one hour ago? It was all about some villager having a dream about four poets, right? How can I believe this uh, military representative? Naturally, I would be much more inclined to believe her. This is the lady, the psychic medium who was employed by the military and who also went inside the tunnels herself. And she also tells an amazing story how the uh, original laboratory owners uh, landed there and paid a visit to collect their stuff when they noticed that somebody is uh, coming on their property. Probably many of you would uh, consider that a little bit too far-fetched to believe in but actually in this documentary they interviewed also the local people simple villagers who by the way confirmed that they saw strange lights in the sky exactly in that day and place uh, where and when the medium was uh, saying that the other races came to collect their property from the laboratory. Well, at the end, uh, you will hear a very familiar ending. The tunnel was uh, covered. It was uh, heavily cemented, closed as tight as possible. And many, many heavy mines were placed so that nobody tries to open it. And of course, the military representative says that I don't know anything about any artifacts at all. And really, qu question remains, if uh, they dug uh, to two years and... Um, uh, didn't find anything as he is assuring us why this case still has uh, the status of top top secret like the highest level of uh, secrecy uh, possible uh, if if there was really nothing <laughs> And again, during mining operations and again under many meters of coal, this uh, wheel was found in Ukraine.
in America, again, under many meters of um, coal, walls were found. Like They looked like cement walls upon which they closed the entire mining operation within hours and filled the shaft with stones to make it absolutely inaccessible. Also, there is a curious site in Turkey named the Genuklev site. The tufa stones are on the top of it, they are embracing the old walls. So, these buildings at the Genuklev site might be also very old. Of course, it's not sure because uh, when was the tufa formed and how is also very much open to question. And an entire collection of uh, similar old artifacts can be found in the work of Michael Kremo. And for some reason, a few thousand years ago, those um, isolated pockets of people who knew more decided to make their culture worldwide and uh, join with the less developed people. And maybe it was exactly the Atlanteans, as Edgar Casey and other sources suggest. Here in the old codex, even the name matches Atslan. And this spring in Turkey, I was surprised to find out how often I would see and hear this very same name Aslan in connection with very old ruins. And it's not just in Turkey, also in other places in Asia. Another interesting parallel is that um, from the books of Set, Set Speaks, we find out that um, Lemurians, they did the same thing at the end when they understood that um, their civilization is about to come to an end. They simply blended with the local people, intermarried them and in this way practically disappeared. So possibly the fate of the Atlanteans was very similar at the end when they were obviously defeated by their enemies, their motherland was destroyed, submerged. Maybe they simply realized that they are too weak now to withstand the onslaughts of their enemies and uh, they just blended with the simple tribes and that was the end. And maybe from that point on they turned from Atlanteans to survivors, people who flee just so that they can survive. Indonesia, ancient temples, strange writing on the stones. Like the old Malay, which according to mainstream history is the first language over there. Even less similar to the classic Malay. A bit more similar to some other ancient uh, scripts of the region, but still not the same. Why there is no mention of this script in the mainstream uh, history? Is it because the same runic symbols are found in regions which supposedly had nothing to do with Indonesia. Very similar, if not the very same symbols, for example, from the pyramid in the Lamada, Ecuador. And not only the symbols in Ecuador are very similar. Very similar is also the way they are treated by the modern academia. In the official history, there is no culture whatsoever that should have been creating such things, not only in Ecuador, but in all America as such. The Indonesian symbols seem also very similar to those on the Kensington stone from US. And countless other artifacts as shown in the earlier episode about America. And uh, runes are found all over the world. This is from Turkey, 
And although the name runes is different, the writing is the same. Also, what is called the Paleo Hebrew seems to be very, very similar to those runes. More or less, uh, all ancient uh, nations of Europe used uh, runes. Some other ancient Asian scripts are also very, very similar to the runes. And these two are from India. The Saudi Arabians also had their, uh, well, is it uh, runes or pre-Sanskrit, people call it with the different names. But it is very, very similar to what we saw in Indonesia, in uh, South and North America, because all over Europe. And although the writing would be very similar or even identical, if it is found in different countries, the academia will give it uh, completely different names so that it will look as if the people were indeed backwards and restricted to their own village or their tribe at most. The very presence of rooms worldwide suggests just by itself the existence of a one world culture in the past. But for the modern mainstream history, this is such unbearable heresy that um, they had to even create worldwide network busy with uh, hiding under all kinds of excuses the artifacts which testify to the existence of this worldwide civilization. The best artifacts, they never even make it to the museums. They disappear in numbered boxes on the way straight from the excavation sites. For example, we are shown the magnificent uh, frescoes from uh, Bonampak, Guatemala. But what about going there in person? Here you can read the story of how somebody with full government permits nearly ended in jail just for visiting the site, which, by the way, on the ground is not an archaeological site, is a top-secret military site. Digging out old artifacts is classified as top-secret operation and is, by the way, conducted by foreign entities. And the other artifacts, which are milder, so to say, but still openly contradict the stories that they are telling us to be history, those they, they do reach the museums, but they are not exhibited. An average of 15% uh, of uh, the items which are stored in a given museum are shown to the public. The rest is simply locked. Always the pretext is not enough exhibition space, which is of course not true. We live in a digital age. They could have very easily at least provided uh, images of uh, the hidden artifacts. They don't do that. Also, they always uh, complain of lack of funding. Then what about uh, making it possible for everybody to see the hidden artifacts for an extra fee. Of course, not everything can be stolen in numbered boxes or uh, hidden away or destroyed. Like, for example, the vehicle tracks we've seen in the previous videos, they are just too big, too many to be destroyed or hidden. So what do they do with them? They either do their best to declare them as uh, being hoaxes, even though there is no ground for uh, saying so. And when that doesn't work as well, they simply ignore them. And that works pretty well, because uh, people nowadays are very short-sighted, very gullible, at least the majority, and in general not much interested in their past, they don't understand its importance. And so we were talking about this uh, very old style of 
writing which was known all over the world. That's not a surprise because we have also megaliths of the same unique polygonal masonry style all over the world as well. That's a little bit too complex for the simple people to figure out just like that independently at various spots, more or less at the same time. So obviously there was somebody transmitting this knowledge. And the mummies of these people are still sometimes to be found. They were tall, sometimes with fair or red hair, and their features were very refined. Some of them had elongated skulls. Do you remember this beautiful lady from China? Well, the absolutely same people were the head of the advanced culture in Egypt. Just the very look of this Egyptian mummy, even without performing uh, tests on it, it becomes clear to what uh, kind of uh, group of people it belonged. Artifacts, Egyptian artifacts, confirm this uh, blonde, blue-eyed looks. Same mummies are also found on the Canary Islands. If you have seen Planet of the Megaliths, you will be familiar with the pyramids over there as well. Same, absolutely same situation in Peru. Blue eyes, light-haired uh, mummies, Caucasian features, Caucasian DNA. <laughs> On an old photo, we also see a blonde child in Hawaii amongst the Maoris. This doesn't uh, happen naturally in their race. And um, again in their race are the Pato Palarehe people of uh, New Zealand, which uh, didn't agree at all with the mainstream history of New Zealand. That's why they declared it to be legend, although same people are living even nowadays. Now, this mummy from Iran barely needs any explanation. Not only the blonde hair, but the very facial features speak for themselves. Now, do you notice the blonde braid on this uh, mummy? It's actually a tall Caucasian lady and it's found in Russia, but in regions that are officially considered to have been um, inhabited in ancient times by other races. Actually, exactly at the time when everybody in Russia was in shock from the news about the exploding uh, war in Ukraine, in that uh, moment of confusion and distracted attention, some unknown people approached the Russian authorities and actually convinced them somehow that, you see, it is not good to have this mummy like this, it is disrespectful to the dead, you have to actually burn it or put it in the ground or somehow anyhow get rid of it because this is uh, disrespectful to the spirit that resided in this body. And all this was done very silently, anonymously and without any publicity. But because Russian people have and watch and believe many documentaries like the Survivor series, they're not so stupid and they understood what's going on and they made such a social upheaval against it that this project of disposing of the uncomfortable uh, mummy was uh, exposed and stopped and the Russians are still in possession of their valuable artifact. These are actually the people who indeed placed the bedrock of everything we now call civilized or civilization. It wasn't the Romans. That's a big lie. There is nothing special about Rome at all. It was actually one of the minor centers of the decaying culture brought by the survivors. The so-called Glorious Roman Empire didn't come up with anything. It was actually decaying. You see here in the older layers of darker stone in front, those are much bigger than the later work, which is simple bricks. 
basically. Rome or even ancient Greece, as we saw in other videos, these were just minor centers where these uh, worldwide building techniques, for example, they are seen in various progressive layers of decay and not of development. There will be lots of surprises in the future episode about the Roman Empire. Do you see the inscription on the world? famous pantheon. Of course, that inscription is uh, taken as Holy Bible when it comes uh, to telling us who and when built the pantheon, actually. But strange that in the older depictions, the allegedly old inscription is missing. 